Give me a minute, I wanna do a correction video here. Uh, this is a correction video. If you're looking at this chart and thinking, gee, I saw a video like this yesterday, you're not wrong. The only thing was I misread the chart badly. And I'm really grateful to uh, Ratsnack, I, I hope I'm saying that right, uh, who pointed out to me, hey, I think you're reading the chart wrong. And I, I was. So I apologize to everybody and we'll try to go through this this time correctly. Um, I was just rushing yesterday and I made a mistake. My apologies. So let's take a look. This is the balance of arms as we believe it stands today versus what it looked like at the beginning of the war. And so if we take a look, uh, when it came to tanks at the beginning of the war, the Russians had roughly three times as many tanks. Today, the Ukrainians have a hundred more tanks than the Russians. They're, they're actually outpacing the Russians when it comes to tanks. When it comes to heavy guns, at the beginning of the war, the Russians had roughly three to one advantage. Today, that advantage is closer, it's less than two to one. At the beginning of the war with multiple launch rocket systems, the Russians had almost a four to one advantage. Today, it's half that, it's about a two to one advantage. Now you can look at that and you can say, Petey, hey, in two of these areas, the Russians are still outpacing the Ukrainians. Yeah, and you would be right. But not anywhere like the stretch that they were at the beginning. What we're seeing is Russia demilitarizing itself. The hardware losses in Ukraine are so substantial. And that's not to say that the Russians can't get a big advantage again. They've got stockpiles and they're drawing on them. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, the air defense systems in Kaliningrad have all been put on uh, IL-76s and shipped to Ukraine or redistributed inside of Russia. Uh, along with lots of other arms and material from Kaliningrad. The Armenian base, uh, Russia maintains a uh, army base in Armenia. They're CSTO members. That has been emptied. We saw the tanks, the ISVs, uh, the uh, trucks and equipment from that base loaded onto trains and sent to Ukraine. Uh, the Finns report that air defenses along the Finnish border, that's, uh, if I'm not mistaken, it's an 800 mile border um, or close to a thousand kilometer border, um, have been thinned out, redeployed inside of Russia or to Ukraine. The Japanese report that the S-300 missile systems on the Kuril Islands are no longer there. They've been redeployed. And so, what we're seeing is a trend where Russia is just throwing everything in the kitchen sink into Ukraine uh, at a cost of its own defense, at a cost of its own defense. They're demilitarizing themselves. Now, if you don't like this chart or this source or you have some other reason why, oh, this doesn't matter, um, let's take a look at something else. The French Institute for International Relations is a, th a French think tank that has just released an analysis of the war in Ukraine and Russia's, uh, the effect of Russia's demilitarization. Now, when we think about the last 30 years, the big flashpoint where everybody expected the war to happen was in the Baltic states. That's Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia which had formerly been socialist republics in the USSR um, and had been under the sway of the Russian Empire for a hundred years before that. And so the big concern was that these small independent states would be the first to suffer a Russian blitzkrieg and be brought back into the fold as Putin sought to reestablish the USSR. That didn't happen, but of course the analysts were worried about it. And so over the years, everybody war-gamed it. There were lots of scenarios. 
And to the best of my knowledge, in none of those scenarios did NATO win. Because they're smaller states, because they all share borders with Russia and Belarus, because there's the exclave of Kaliningrad, everything played in the Russians' favor and they poof, went in, took it, and that was it. It was over. Every scenario that was played out. According to the French Institute for International Relations, that is no longer the case. To, the Russians have suffered so many hardware losses, they cannot even attain parity with NATO. Should the, Going into the Baltics instead of a win now is a certain loss. That's huge. That's huge. This mistake going into Ukraine is likely to go down in history as the geopolitical blunder that ended the Russian empire permanently. Make no mistake, this is Vladimir Putin's doing and there is nothing any of us can do to stop it. As a famous general, I think it was Napoleon once said, never interrupt your enemy when they are making a mistake. Guys, thank you so much for your patience with me. Um, as I try to get better at this. And a big thanks to Patsy Huft, who is the sponsor of this video. Thanks, Patsy.